morning, good afternoon, good evening to people around the world from, uh, from North America to Europe to uh, Australia, India, and other places around the world. This is Martin Hubel, your host of the DB2 Night Show, and I'd like to welcome you to show number 218 of the DB2LUW version. And today, our, my special guest is John Horningbrook from the uh, DB2 Toronto Lab. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing great, Martin. Thanks. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. It's a wonderful day here. The weather is really cooled off, unfortunately, but uh, it seemed we were only uh, 30 degrees on, on uh, Tuesday, and now we're barely getting to 10. So who knows? If you don't like the weather, come back tomorrow. We live in Canada. It will be different tomorrow, and we can complain about it then, too. So to get the show on, we're going to talk. Uh, John is going to uh, take us through DB2 Automatic statistics deep dive and we're, I'm personally looking forward to this talk it will be a good one and uh, before John takes over let me go through and do the uh, administration here's our get involved page with our social media on uh, Twitter and uh, LinkedIn uh, we have our group ID there you can find us as the DB2 night show in both places Follow hashtag DB2 night and you'll you'll uh, get updates about the show Here's our famous disclaimers. Uh, basically, we're recording the show. We respect people's copyrights, including IBM's, and uh, uh, recordings will be and blogs will be made available. And John hopefully will also be kind enough to share a PDF of his slides with us, and we're all set to go. So here is the uh, standard things we do: our quick announcements, our studio audience polls, light at the end of the tunnel, and then uh, we'll also have Q and A throughout the uh, throughout the day or uh, the presentation. I'll be monitoring the uh, question and answer queue, and we'll also uh, uh, have a have a, a brief a commercial message from DBI halfway through the show. And we'll wrap up and uh, see how we did uh, going forward. Oops, I forgot to remove Roy. We already did Roy. He was on uh, September twentieth. I did uh, update the slide and took out Greg Steger from last month. He did a great job on DB2 encryption. Our show is coming up next month for DB2 LUW. We have Amber Crooks joining us from Extivia. Actually, I believe that's changed. She's now uh, moving over to Sherwin-Williams Paint Company in, in Cleveland, although she's still living in uh, Colorado. And on uh, December 13th, we've got George uh, Backlars from the IBM Toronto Lab going to speak to us as well. Uh, for uh, the DB2 Night Show on ZOS, we've got uh, next month is Patrick Bossman talking about DB2 for ZOS development, show and tell on Agile. And we then have Adrian Burke uh, doing the uh, distributed best practices for DB2 today and tomorrow. And on December 20th, I just got Tony Andrews' uh, title in, but unfortunately, uh, my morning being the way it was today, I uh, just got in from the gym. I didn't get a chance to add it, but Tony always does a great job on an application development topic. And I assume that that December 20th show will have some relevance to uh, people in the LUW world, so you might, you might want to put that on your calendar as well. I'll have that properly updated for next month, maybe. But uh, that's what I get for uh, not having a large production staff, uh, mainly just being myself. Other things. Uh, we. Uh, do have the demo. We're actually going to show that part of that demo today is part of the show. It's uh, rather short. If you uh, enroll on the uh, DBI site, you'll get a, uh, a reward for your time. If you'd like to give it Amazon cards, and uh, we'll be doing that. Other things. These are important announcements from IBM. IBM is running a big event. It's a DB2 masterclass on application development for machine learning and AI. This thing is happening, happening over October 11th to 13th. You can join the masterclass by following that link, or if you type in DB2 Masterclass and Hackathon, you'll get there as well. It's free education and a chance to win some money. They've got 15,000 US dollars up for grabs. So if you're interested in uh, learning a lot and possibly earning a little bit of money, uh, do uh, look into that because that'll be just great. Another thing, you notice on our front page that I am an IBM Gold Consultant and an IBM Champion. IBM Champions are re, uh, 
are appointed for each year and renewed based on your contributions and, and, and anticipated future contributions to the DB2 community and other IBM communities. If you want to be recognized as a leader in the IBM community, get additional information from IBM to help you in that role and even get a, a fair bit of uh, IBM swag that says IBM champion on it. Uh, you can uh, do so by signing up to be an IBM champion at developeribm.com uh, slash champions. And uh, I've been a champion now since 2009. And uh, I can tell you there are some benefits if you uh, attend a lot of IBM events. You will get a lot of recognition and it will help your career. Uh, once again, our sponsors for the show are DBI. They are the founding sponsor of the DB2 Night Show. And uh, only because of them do we have a show. And uh, the other sponsor is myself, Martin Hubel Consulting. Now we get into doing our um, world famous studio audience polls. So let me put these up. And uh, first poll is the standard one we always run, which is uh, what DB2 versions are you currently running? And, uh, give that a quick vote. We'll uh, take that and move along. Uh, I guess I need to update that poll. We need to put 11.5 on there, don't we, John? Absolutely. I was, I was just going to mention that. Yes, yeah, well, uh, I'm going to get my top people working on that, too. Probably need to write myself a post-it note and stick it on my forehead so I remember to do that. All right, most people have voted, so I'll close that and share the results. And today we have almost everyone is running uh, DB2 version 11 or 10.5, so we're in pretty good shape that way. People could vote for more than one, so that's why the percentages are greater than 100. The next one, what other things do you run besides DB2 LUW? I've kind of simplified this down to DB2 and other uh, distributed DBMSs, other mainframe databases. We get, we get an awful lot of people that run DB2 on Z as well as DB2 LUW. I think most of the uh, people running uh, LUW are loyal, loyal IBM customers that moved down to DB2 LUW. So we'll give people a couple more cents, uh, seconds to vote on that, and we'll close that one and share it. We see that 75% of our audience does, in fact, run DB2 for ZOS. And, of course, everybody's got a lot of other things. I probably should have put the open source people in there as separate, but I'll remember, again, I'll remember to fix that for next year, uh, next time. And uh, now we're getting into the um, session-specific uh, questions. And... John, you sent me along a question, and I updated it a little differently here. Um, I was wondering if, uh, what people do to run run stats. And uh, the two, three questions I, or options I gave them is we occasionally run run stats. Uh, we schedule run stats by a cron or other schedule. And the last one is we use the automatic statistics collection. And uh, we've gotten uh, over uh, nearly 75% of our audience have voted on that, so I'll close that and share that with you, John. And uh, we've only got 25% of our uh, audience today using the auto stats collection. Wow, I've got I've got some convincing to do. Yes, you do. That'd be uh, I'm looking forward to hearing that. And maybe you should we should have a show on that. Oh, why don't we do it today? And uh, our, our last one is, do you, uh, do you use real-time statistics collection? Uh, this is uh, this one's uh, people are voting on as well. We're up to 64% uh, um, of our audience. It seems we're at 73% of the audience seems to be a sweet spot, spot today. And so let's have a look at that and share that result with our good-looking audience. And what 50 is 50 percent of uh, it's a 50 50 on the real-time statistics collection interesting so another 
topics that we can cover off today, and that takes us to the end of our polls. So now you should be back to seeing the Move Your Mouse screen. And with that, I think we're about ready to turn it over to you. Let me get my list up here, find you, make you the presenter. And now you should be having that um, where you can cl uh, click on it. And there you go. I'm seeing your screen. So please take it away. As I mentioned, I'll be watching the, uh, the question queue and uh, where appropriate, I'll break in and, uh, and, uh, and uh, tell you what's on, uh, any questions that came oh. through. Oh, okay, so you'll uh, we'll stop every now and then to take questions. Well, I'll, I'll just speak over you and say, or in a, in a break saying, hi, John, I got a question, and it'll work. Okay. Right, thanks. Sounds good. Off we go. Okay, thanks, Martin. Okay, good morning, everyone. So uh, as Martin mentioned, this uh, presentation is on uh, DB2's automatic stats collection. So quickly, the agenda will be I'll just a quick overview of uh, what exactly is automatic stats collection. Then I'm going to, you know, take a deep dive into the internal architecture <clears throat> and then talk about some of the monitoring and control that's available because uh, over the years since uh, automatic stats were introduced, uh, you know, users are expressing interest in kind of watching what it's doing, making sure it's doing the right thing. So lots of monitoring has been added over the years. Uh, can be, it can be a little tricky finding out uh, where the current version of the statistic arc, because sometimes they're not in the catalog, so we'll talk about that. And uh, if we have time, we'll talk about how to customize auto, auto stats for your environment. So quick overview, I think everybody knows what run stats is. It's the utility the DBD uses to collect statistics on tables and indexes. Uh, this, why do we collect statistics? It's essential for query optimization. The optimizer uses the stats to compute the, the, the cost of an access plan and the number of rows that are processed within. And there's kind of two categories of statistics. There's statistics about the physical attributes of the database objects, like the number of pages in a table or number of levels in an index or clustering, that type of thing. And then there's statistics about the data itself. So how many rows are in the table? How many distinct values in a column? What is the distribution? The stats for all that type of thing. And the statistics are stored in the system catalogs. And you can see them in uh, the SysStat and SysCat views in the five uh, views listed below. So what is automatic stats collection? So this is basically DB2 will you know, essentially do run stats uh, for you. It uses two approaches. Uh, it will collect statistics, we call it asynchronously or in the background. So, uh, you know, there's a daemon that kind of uh, runs as DB2 is running and it will periodically wake up and collect statistics. The other approach is that the query optimizer might decide that it doesn't have sufficient statistics and it will drive a stats collection at query optimization time. And this is something we call real-time statistics. Uh, call that synchronous collection. And so the tables that need stats are identified by a few factors. So the key one is uh, how much uh, the data has changed over time, uh, whether that change changed the data distribution significantly. And then for real-time stats, we look at what stats does the particular statement need. In some cases, statements don't need that many stats. Sometimes they need lots of stats. Autostats works for tables and indexes. It also works for nicknames uh, in a federated environment, and it works for a special type of view called a statistical view. And the automatic stats collection was designed to be unobtrusive and low overhead. Uh, I'm going to go through um, that in more detail in the presentation. And just some history. Um, the asynchronous or background stats collection was introduced in DB2 8.2 and real-time stats came along in 9.5. So as I mentioned, the auto stats or background stats collection uh, occurs periodically. So tables are evaluated every two hours and whether or not stats are collected are based on the amount of uh, change that's occurred with the data. And there are user controls for uh, when the collection occurs 
and on what table the collection occurs. And I'm going to go into the actual, you know, algorithm for when stats are collected uh, in a few more pages. And we contrast that with real-time stats collection. So this is the one that happens at statement compilation time, determined by the optimizer. Uh, so again, it's the whether or not a table gets stats is, you know, based on how much it's changed, but it's also based on the statistical needs of the query. And stats uh, can either be collected with a full run stats, or they can be what we call fabricated. So uh, the stats are uh, kind of derived on the fly based on some metadata maintained by the, uh, the, the DB2 runtime. And I'm going to talk more about that later on too. Uh, the stats are made immediately available to other connections through a statistics cache. Uh, so they are not written to the catalogs immediately to, to minimize any overhead that could occur due to that. Um, if, if stats weren't fully collected, so if we just did a kind of a quick fabrication or like a sample stats, uh, a request to collect the full stats in the background will be initiated immediately after that. And as I mentioned, the real-time stats are important because um, they're more immediate. So with the synchronous, uh, the asynchronous collection, it uh, only does evaluation every two hours. Real-time stats will get you the stats, get the optimizer the stats immediately. So a bit of history on, on how to uh, activate real-time stats and auto stats and uh, exactly what the database configuration parameters are. So this shows uh, the full set of database configuration parameters associated with automatic run stats as of 11.5. So auto Automatic run stats uh, is part of a hierarchy under the auto mate set of uh, options. And there are four sub options below the auto run stats option. So there's a separate switch for auto statement stats, and then one for statistical views, and then when, one that controls whether or not uh, sampling is done by auto run stats. New to 11.5 is a fourth switch that controls whether or not column group statistics are uh, collected automatically. I'm going to talk about, about that more in the presentation. Uh, and then um, and it's important to point out that uh, because of this hierarchy, um, auto run stats uh, can be on while auto statement stats is off, but uh, the reverse isn't true. So you can't have uh, real-time stats or auto stats enabled if auto stats is off. You have to go in, go in that hierarchy. So back in 11.1, .1, uh, pretty much the same set of config options other than, of course, uh, auto suggests uh, didn't exist at that point. The one change was that uh, automatic sampling uh, was enabled by default for new databases. So whenever you see that these config perms are on by default, that that uh, just, just applies for, for new da databases. If you upgraded and the switches were off, they would remain off over an upgrade. And then we go back to 10.1. 10.1 was when uh, auto run stat support for statistical views was introduced and when automatic sampling was introduced. And both of those were off at that point. Uh, and then uh, auto sampling, of course, was enabled by default in 10.5. And then all the way back to 9.7, there were a few other changes. So um, auto, this is when real-time stats uh, was actually renamed, and uh, there were two older forms of uh, auto stats collection that uh, were deprecated at, at that point in time. So it was automatic stats profiling and auto profile updates. Um, those have been kind of largely replaced with the automatic column group stats that were introduced in 11.5. Okay, now we'll take a deep dive into uh, how auto stats collection actually works. So really, you know, this is an autonomic feature. You don't necessarily know, need to know the implementation details to use it. Just flip the switch and away it goes. But if you want to feel more comfortable about, uh, you know, enabling it in your environment, uh, it's always interesting to peek under the hood and see, see how it works. So let's, uh, let's dive into that. So this diagram shows the auto stats collection architecture within DB2. The, um, box on the left shows the kind of decision process that occurs for the background or async collection. 
and the diagrams on on the right show how the stats uh, are hooked into the system catalogs and where uh, real-time stats fits into the whole architecture. So the real-time stats components are the parts in green on this on this diagram. Uh, the other parts are shared between auto stats and real-time stats. So the, you know, the, starting in, in the center, the, the important part of the diagram is the system catalog is where the stats go. And then there's this special type of uh, two special caches, the, the catalog cache, which uh, caches the metadata about you know, all the necessary catalog information uh, that the SQL compiler and optimizer uses when it's compiling SQL statements. And then alongside the catalog cache is this new statistics cache. And this is where stats will temporarily live if they've been collected by the uh, real-time stats collection. And at some point, the stats and the stats cache will get published to the system catalogs. And then the uh, whether or not tables have stats collected by the background stats collection is represented by the box on the left. And it would be better for me to explain that process on the next slide where there's a little more details about the, uh, the decision. So the asynchronous or background stats collection occurs every two hours and DB2 determines whether stats should be collected based on uh, whether the table has been accessed since the last database activation. So if it hasn't, then there's no collection. If the table has no statistics, uh, it's always going to have stats collected. If it has stats, then it depends on uh, how much of the data has changed since stats were last collected. And this is determined based on a counter of the number of rows that are updated, deleted, or inserted. We call this the UDI counter. And this, uh, and this counter, uh, there's various ways that, that it can be seen through monitoring. I'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. The, um, so if the, you know, if the UDI shows that it's had a rel relatively small change, so I put small in quotes because it's not an absolute value, it, uh, the, the actual value the, depends on, on the size of the table. So if, if it's been relatively small, then no, no clutch is necessary. If it's large, so on the higher end, then that will always be collected. And if it's somewhere in the middle, then um, the decision process is, it becomes a little bit more uh, sophisticated. So if the change is somewhere between small and large, uh, then we take a look at uh, is, is the table due for an evaluation based on its past history. So if it's a relatively small table, less than 4,000 pages, then you say, what the heck, just collect stats. It's not going to, you know, the overhead is going to be relatively small. If it's a larger table, then uh, auto stats will first collect a small uh, sample of the statistics and it will compare that to uh, the current uh, statistics. And it does a, a a data distribution comp, uh, comparison. And if it doesn't look like the data distribution has changed, then it won't bother uh, collecting stats. Because it's possible for a table to have had a lot of insert, update, delete activity, but it didn't really change the distribution of the data. And so from a query optimization perspective, the access plans that were generated before will likely be just as good and there's no, no, no need to, to initiate uh, stats collection. So real-time stats collection, as I mentioned, occurs at SQL statement compilation time. It's based on a counter of the amount of UDI activity, except it's a separate counter called the, called the real-time stats UDI counter. So it's the, it's the same, except that this counter is reset after every you know, uh, synchronous or real-time stats collection, and it's not written to disk whereas the other UDI counter is persistent to disk so that when the database goes down and comes back up, um, a asynchronous stats collection you know, can know that, um, that there was some amount of change against the, that table and it will correctly determine when stats are needed again. Uh, and so it drives the synchronous stats collection by uh, both looking at the UDI counter and the, you know, what statistics actually needs. And then there's different ways that uh, the stats can be collected. We're going to talk about 
talk about that in the uh, next couple of pages. The first thing I talked about is uh, determining if the query actually needs statistics. So this is done through something called the sensitivity analyzer. And so the, uh, you know, some statements that are very simple, uh, like the one shown on this page where, uh, you know, if it's simply quality predicate, uh, if there's a unique index on ID, the optimizer is always going to choose an index scan with a unique index. And so there's no, no need to, you know, generate, you know, initiate uh, stats collection during optimization at that point. And this is done to uh, avoid overhead to OIL, OLTP applications. Uh, you know, the optimizer try to make this decision as quick as possible. And then different optimization levels. Uh, so DB2 supports uh, setting different, different optimization levels for the query optimizer. And so the lower optimization levels don't need, they don't use the, you know, the additional statistics like for distributions. So in that case, if you're running at a lower op level, no, the RTS isn't going to occur because the optimizer is not going to use those stats anyway. And um, if even if the even if a uh, you know stats collection isn't determined to be necessary, some basic stats might might still be fabricated just because it's easy to do. So if we can update the cardinality and the F pages uh, and look at those, then it, it will do that anyway because there's there's really no no cost significant cost to do that. And then the sensitivity analyzer, analyzer will also look at uh, how old the stats are, whether they're, whether they're stale. So this is based on uh, the UDI counter. Uh, the, the, um, as I said, this counter, the, this amount of change uh, isn't an absolute value. It's uh, so smaller tables uh, will require a larger percentage UDI changes and, and larger tables will require a smaller percentage change. And that's done because, you know, very large tables, they might not have the same percentage change as a smaller table. And so these large tables might not have statistics collected as often, but that small percentage change for the table could be very important for query optimization. So, so it needs to have a smaller threshold for the larger tables. And this algorithm is, is, is exactly the same between the background asynchronous collection and, and the uh, real-time stats. And then the third step with the sensitivity analyzer is determining whether there are any missing interesting statistics. So uh, if any interesting stats are missing, you know, stats are going to be collected regardless of the UDI uh, change. And interesting stats are determined by uh, how the columns are used in the query, so in, how they're used in predicates. So if there are, for example, input uh, parameter markers, then DB2 can't, the optimizer can't use the distribution stats because it can't compare the value to the stats, the value in the predicate to the stats because, because it doesn't have it yet, unless you're using the uh, re-op once or always bind options, in which, in which case it could, and so the, the distribution stats are important in that case. And it also, you know, considers uh, what options have been specified in the statistics profile. Uh, the statistics profile is a way to record what uh, run stats options you want to use for a particular table. And so, for example, if you said, well, don't collect distribution stats, then real-time stats said, well, they're not there. There's no point in, uh, you know, generating a stats request because it's not, you know, the profile says not to collect them anyway. And I'm going to talk more about stats profile. Uh, stats profiles later in the presentation. So then uh, once the sensitivity analyzer has determined uh, whether or not stats are collected, need to be collected, then it determines how. And so the, um, again, this is based on uh, the RTS UDI and uh, the interesting stats. So there's uh, a couple of, a few methods avail available. One is this fabrication method. So uh, a, a subset of the statistics are derived based on some metadata that's maintained by the index and data manager. And uh, this is a very, a very, very fast approach. And then the, uh, there's a synchronous collection, which will basically drive a, a regular run stats uh, at, you know, right from the optimizer at, at uh, prepare time. Uh, now that sounds kind of scary, but the, the uh, run stats is done with a time limit. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about how you can control that. So the you know, default five five seconds, uh, and uh, if it can't do that, then it would uh, schedule a, a background 
stats collection and then just use the fabrication method. Or in some cases, um, the, the sensitivity analyzer might decide uh, maybe just to do a fabrication and just schedule a background stats uh, to occur. And that, that uh, should occur within five minutes of real-time stats uh, determining that that should happen. So a few details on the fabrication method. So one, one approach uh, for what we call partial fabrication is, is, is just to uh, update the uh, high to key and low to key um, of the histograms in, in the system catalogs if needed. Um, it's also known as the, as the quantile stored in the systat dot call disk catalog. And so, and so this becomes more important for uh, some columns, uh, usually ones that are based on time, that uh, you know are you know will continually have new you know dates or times as data is uh, updated or or inserted or changed, and uh, because you know there could be a relatively large amount of data that has been in, in, ingested, um, queries that have predicates on those columns would still be making you know their decision based on the old old stats, and so uh, if we can quickly update. The, uh, the high end of the stats for, for these columns, the optimizer will have a better idea of whether or not new values have been introduced into the range. And so the, uh, uh, you can also do a full fabrication for the table in, in index stats, uh, so not just this quick, quick update of the high to key and low to key. Uh, and this is, the, the full fabrication is done if uh, the amount of UDI didn't warrant a full synchronous collection or, or if the, you know, we try to do synchronous collection, like a full run stat and a timed out hit the five second limit, then it, it can do this full fabrication, which uh, just, just basically uses the metadata and, and still touches up the, the high two key and low two key. So this page just shows an example of, uh, you know, how, what, what's actually happening in that case. So if we had a, you know, a predicate with, you know, was looking for an order date, uh, you know, say greater than, you know, January 31st and, uh, you know, you know, new data had been uh, introduced uh, for February, so the new, you know, the new high date is like March 1st. You know, without without that, the the optimizer might, you know, if you came along with a predicate, um, it, it'll think, oh, there's no rows, so um, you know, maybe you know, it could significantly change what type of access path or join method would be used. And so, just by probing uh, the index. Uh, it can determine what the new highest value is, and then it can update the uh, the high end of the histogram and and the high two key for that call. So I think I've already mentioned this. The uh, there's two stats methods: the synchronous and the asynchronous. So actually, I'm going to skip this one because I've already talked about it. Um, some more details on on the derivations I've talked about. We can probe the the uh, index. Uh, the high and low end of the index to update the high to key and low to key on the histograms if necessary. Uh, there's some stats that are maintained by the index manager. So uh, index manager always maintains the full key card, which is the number of distinct values in the in the index, number of leaf level, number of leaf pages, uh, number of levels. Um, the data manager knows how many uh, pages that the table takes up. So the optimizer can get a rough estimate of the number of rows in the table by you know, dividing the number of pages by the average uh, row width uh, based on the catalog information. And there's a few other ways that uh, it can fabricate the stats and in the interest of time, I'm just gonna, gonna pass over those for now. A Couple of other considerations for the sensitivity analyzer. Uh, tables that are marked volatile are not considered uh, for real-time stats. And that's because, um, the, you know, the data could be changing too frequently, so it would drive too many stats collections. So um, we, can, we can use the existing fabrication and heuristics for optimization, but it's not going to drive the, uh, the, the run stats collection. The asynchronous, the background stats collection is not done for declared global temporary tables, and that's just because there's, there's no, uh, you know, each of those DTTs is, pri is private to a, a given connection, and there's no catalog um, to, to store the, no catalog entries to store those stats anyway. So the, uh, but the synchronous collection uh, will still be done for the DGGT if it doesn't already have statistics. And uh, another important consideration is, is 
DB2 supports a, a way to manually uh, set the statistics in the catalog just by updating, you know, you can issue an update statement directly against the SysStat or, or SysCat views, and you can change the, the stats yourselves. Um, so that, if you do that, that will uh, automatically, you know, disqualify the, the table from any type of automatic stats collection. And that's because, you know, we assume that if you've manually updated the stat, that you've taken control of, um, of how the stats are updated. And this is important to do because if you're using DB2 look to, to do a simulation of your system, it would be bad if, you know, auto run stats came along and overwrote those stats uh, because the in that case, the table typically doesn't have any rows in it. Uh, you've just copied the stats from, a, from another system. Uh, and a few other points, a truncated table considered to have an infinite UDI and uh, the uh, real-time stats doesn't occur for some of these special hybrid statements that are both hot, hybrid DDL and DMLs, uh, like set integrity or refresh table. I mentioned that there's a time limit on um, how long the you know the synchronous or real-time stats stats collection will occur, and it's five seconds. This can be configured using uh, an optimization guideline. If you can. Uh, you can either set these as an opt profile or you can just add them as a, as a embedded hint at the uh, end of the SQL statement. And the uh, <clears throat> time units, uh, you know, milliseconds in this case. Um, now let's move on to um, another topic, automatic, automatic stats sampling. So this is a, a feature that was added in uh, 10 point uh, one or 10.5 now I can't, I can't remember exactly the uh, um, so this basically so run stats uh, you know the run stats command supports a couple of sampling options you can use page level or uh, row level sampling uh, but you have to determine whether or not you want to do that and what the sampling rate is if you set this configuration parameter then uh, you know db2 automatic stats collection will will choose the sampling method and and the sampling rate and so it, it's basically it's going to choose uh, page level sampling, uh, regardless of whether uh, you you know you're collecting stats for the data or the index pages. And uh, where supported, we can actually collect. Uh, we can do sampling for statistical views and use page level sampling. That's a takes a little bit more time to explain how that's possible, but but, but it can be done. And um, in general, you know it's going to and, and there'll be two different sampling rates for for the uh, for the data and the uh, index pages, because typically we don't sample the uh, index pages with as, as 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 low a value because the you know the the data is you know denser on the index page, so we can read more. We need to read more of it to to ensure uh, we collect accurate stats for them. I don't know, Martin. If at this point you wanted to to break in kind of be at the halfway mark here. Okay, thanks for that, uh, John. Uh, let me take over, uh, take back control for a minute. And we'll run uh, run our little uh, insightful presentation from, uh, from DBI. I've got it here and it should go forward. And let me hit play on this. And, uh, this is uh, an automated uh, Demonstration. Unfortunately, there's no sound, but um, it's rather obvious what it does. It's basically showing the new interface for the DBI toolset, Brother Panther, I believe, and uh, it goes through and shows the average and best worst and best worst scores for all of the databases that you have, various repositories, collectors. It gives you information that you can take to management to say how well your uh, database environment is working. Um, not only is Martin. Martin, so sorry. So, so far, everything's black on on the screen. Oh, really? That's fun. So, how about I stop this and let's go back and try again? Can you see your picture now? Yes. All right. Let's uh, go over here and uh, let me start this again. See what happens. Are you still black? It went black. It was. You could see it, and then whatever you clicked. Uh... Ha! All right. Well, that's no, that's no good. I don't know if it's just me, uh, other uh, viewers. Oh, I'm sure that's the case. If, if it's you, then it's everyone. Or 
enough people that that would be uh, most unfortunate. I, I don't know why it's not working. This is essentially the, the demo that we pointed people to off the DBI website. We were just trying to show it and make sure people saw. Can you see the picture there now? Yes. All right. Thanks for letting me know. Basically, this was going through and just highlighting each one of the boxes here from the min, max, and average stores for each database in terms of performance level. In the DBI world, a score of 10,000 is really great or perfect. And a score of zero is, well, that's the worst. <laughs> uh, often there seems to be some databases that are, are in the green and some that are in the red. And of course, you want, it's just telling you where to spend your time. It also tells you what things are the worst, what's the best, the highest transaction read times and write times, CPU time, so that you know where to go and spend time in terms of tuning your database and the amount of memory used. Overall index read efficiency, that's one of the things that DBI does extremely well is to talk about its read efficiency and uh, how well your indexes support the workload or the SQL that you have, your SQL workload. And it also looks at sorts and highest log writes. Sorry, the, DB, the demo didn't work. It certainly worked fine for me off the website and off uh, locally, but through GoToWebinar, it goes black. So I think that's enough. Uh, time uh, in terms of the commercial, so I'm going to, uh, uh, from there, I'm just going to uh, uh, see if I can move that forward, and I'll put, the, in the meantime, I will move it back to you, and now you're back to being the presenter, and thank, I'll thank everyone for their time. And there we are. Oh, did it go back to the... Uh... From the current slide. I think you got back to the beginning of your slide, so maybe just select the slide you want down the left side. Okay. Kind of curious. Go. Wow. Um, oh, you. It's. It is refreshing to know it's not just me. There, resume. Oh, there you go. Okay. Beautiful. It was, uh, it, I think there was some special uh, features. Technology is going to be the, the uh, life and death yeah. of us all at once. Okay. All right, we're back online. Thanks. Um, all right, next uh, next topic uh, in Autostats collection is the statistics cache. So when uh, synchronous stats are collected, uh, Query optimization time. The stats are not stored in the system catalogs. You know this would require uh, could require a lot of I/O depending on you know how many columns and how many frequent values and quantiles, and this could cause lock contention, and that just would be a bad thing at statement prepare time. So instead, the stats are stored in a stats cache, and these will be written to the system catalogs by the background uh, uh, stats daemon, uh, typically within five minutes. And because they're in the stats cache, they're uh, made av immediately available to other uh, you know, connections that are doing compilations. And so they don't need to wait for the stats to become available in the system catalog. They can get them you know, straight out of the stats cache. And so the stats cache is really just kind of part of the existing uh, catalog cache. It don't exist on the catalog uh, database partition in, in a DPF environment. And you can see what's in the stats cache by uh, using the db2pd tool. So this is an example. So there is a dash statistics cache details option and it will dump a, a nice uh, kind of text output of uh, the stats for a, well, for all the tables that are in the stats cache. And if, for anyone who's familiar with the db2cat tool, the output is uh, basically the same. So there are some uh, interesting considerations for real-time stats in the catalog cache. So when the, uh, the stats that are collected synchronously go into the uh, catalog cache, they don't hard invalidate the existing entries in the cache, which means that you know, if someone uh, was using them, it would have to, like if some other compilation was reading them, it would have to you know, wait for them uh, to release them before putting in the new stats. What it does is it, it just 
soft and validate them. So it just marks and says, okay, these are old stats. <clears throat> and then it'll put the, the new version of the stats into the catalog cache. So any kind of new lookups by new uh, you know, st statement compilations will pick up the uh, latest entries from the stats cache. And these old versions are going to get aged out uh, eventually. So this means that uh, when, you, when you dump the catalog cache, you could actually see mul multiple entries for the same table, but only one is valid. And so, uh, and you can, and DB2PD will um, actually show the difference. And so this means that uh, if you're using real-time stats, there could be a bit of extra space required in the catalog cache. You know, real-time stats have been on, you know, available for a long time. Um, rarely seen a need to actually increase the size. So, but you know, that, that is something you, you know, you could do if it was necessary, but I've rarely seen it uh, needed to be done. And so if you use DB2PD the, with the catalog cache option, so this is just an example of what you'd see for a, you know, this order line table that uh, happens to have two entries. So one entry is the current one, which is with the V for valid, and the, uh, the status of S means it's an older version with older stats, and that S1 is going to get aged out uh, at some point. All right, so some considerations for static and dynamic SQL statements. So, uh, so uh, when <clears throat> stats are collected, whether they're you know background or doing query optimization, uh, any statements in the dynamic statement cache that reference those tables are going to be invalidated. And so that's so that they can be you know when those statements come back again for execution, they'll be recompiled with the most current stats. The, the dy dynamic statement cache itself doesn't, you know, do the same type of sensitivity analysis as the query optimizer. So, you know, so, so, so it, uh, you know, it, it's a very, you know, it's a very high performance type of cache. We've got to minimize the overhead for, you know, lookups into the cache. So in environments where there's not as many uh, SQL statement compilations occurring because all the statements are in the cache, that means that you're going to have fewer real-time stats collections occurring. However, the background, you know, auto run stats is still going to occur, and that will cause periodic uh, invalidations of the dynamic statement cache as things change. Now, static uh, statements, static packages are not invalidated by synchronous or asynchronous collection. Um, just like regular run stats, you will need to perform a manual bind or rebind to pick up the new stats. However, when you're, you're during the course of a, a bind or rebind, uh, real-time stats could occur at that point, so that uh, you know whatever static statements you're compiling at that point will be done with the, the best statistics possible. As I mentioned earlier, you can control um, what tables uh, have stats collected and the maintenance window using something called automated maintenance policy. The policy is specified using a set of stored procedures, and there's uh, some, you know, the, the formats kind of in this XML format that are in the, uh, you can find it in the uh, Knowledge Center or in the, in the, the uh, speaker notes of this presentation. The, the list of tables, so you, you basically you can specify like a predicate that would be applied against this cat dot tables that will specify, you know, which tables to be uh, included or excluded from stats collection, and that list of tables applies to both the background or you know, the synchronous or asynchronous collection. Uh, the maintenance window uh, just applies to the uh, background stats collection. The maintenance window does not not apply to the real time stats. Next topic I want to talk about are something called statistical profiles. So this is basically a way to register uh, run stats options in the system catalog so that the, those run stats options can be used for subsequent run stats so you don't have to you know, you know, record them in your own scripts. Uh, and so that uh, because there's different ways for DB2 to collect stats, you know, the, you know, the background stats, the real-time stats, this way it ensures that uh, a consistent set of stats is, is collected for, for all those different methods. And even some of the utilities like load uh, you can collect stats with with a load in some situations, and this will ensure that you're getting the you know using the same 
same stats options in that case. So the, the stats profile is just stored in a column in, um, you know, sys, it should be syscap.tables, statistic profile. And it's, uh, you know, basically it's just the same, it's the run stats and the same uh, run stats command string as a, as a position. John? Yes. Uh, just a question on uh, st statistical profiles. I've, I've started using them. I like them, but I have to set them up. Uh, and let's say I want to use the same options. Uh, and what it does is it allows me to use the same run stats options over and over for an object. Suppose I wanted to make that the standard for my shop and do all of the same statistics for a wide number of tables. Is there an easy way to be able to set up the or copy a statistics profile between tables? So no, there's no no easy way you, you, know you would have. I'm, I yeah. say uh, for indexes all and, and with distribution, for example, and I wanted to do that for let's say. Uh, 20 or 30 tables, I have to type those options in or create those commands and run them once saying uh, save profile. And then uh, then yeah. I say use profile and use profile is super easy after that. But that first time through, I've got to make sure I have the command set up for every single table, right? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, there's no there's no way to set this. So one, one option would be to register uh, like a global stats profile that applies to, like, say, for example, the schema or maybe the whole database. Um, unfortunately, at this point in time, there's, there's no there's no way to do that. Okay. Uh, maybe it's uh, maybe that's an enhancement request. Yeah, actually, that would be a that would be a good good uh, aha uh, request item. All right. Thank you. No problem. So here's some examples of uh, using stats profiles. Uh, so uh, basically, if you want to register it, you you know type out your run stats options as you normally would, and then say set profile. And then the next time we want to, if you want to use you know, run stats on the table and use those options, you say use profile. Uh, you can actually update an existing profile using the update profile option. And if for some reason you don't like the <clears throat> the profile you have, you want to completely replace it, you can use the unset profile and, and start all over. So. Uh, Stat profiles are, uh, you know, kind of been interesting for auto stats collection uh, because, as mentioned earlier, real-time stats and auto stats will use the stats profiles when they're available. Uh, if, you, if you don't have a stats profile, these are the default options uh, in green here that uh, both uh, will auto run stats will use. Uh, real-time stats, there are some exceptions where it won't follow the stats profile identically. So it, you know, for example, if you have a, a sampling rate that you like to use or a sampling method for a particular table, it might not use that because it's got to do something faster to limit the overhead. Um, maybe in some cases uh, it can't uh, fabricate stats for all columns, can't as requested by the stats profile. So anytime uh, real-time stats can't collect the stats as specified in the stats profile, it will initiate a background stats collection, which all, will always obey what you uh, put in the stats profile. Um, right, one more topic, so getting to the top of the hour. I want to quickly mention uh, this automatic column group statistics feature that was added in 11.5. So quick re review of you know, what are column group statistics. They're basically, they, they collect the number of distinct values for a set of columns. So but, but one of the basic stats that DB2 collects is the number of distinct values in, in individual columns. Uh, you know, with an extra clause in the run stats where you just, you know, group statements with an extra set of parentheses, uh, run stats will collect the number of distinct values for, for all the columns within that set of parentheses. And this is very helpful for the optimizer in order to recognize whether the data is correlated between different sets of columns. So kind of classic example, uh, use an insurance database, so you know, you're going to have a policy number, and each policy might have a number of revisions. And if you just look at the absolute number of revisions, uh, the optimizer you know, might think that there's like 20 revisions for every policy, but that number just really represents the maximum number of revisions for, for some policy out there. And maybe most policies don't have that number of revisions, maybe only one or two. And so uh, collecting the number of distinct values for the combination of policy number and policy revision will help the optimizer get a better estimate for search conditions, you know, joins, or even local predicates involving those columns. 
So what an automatic column group uh, stats does is it will auto, you know, auto run stats will automatically detect, uh, you know, these data correlations and set a statistics profile uh, to collect uh, stats on these groups of columns. And, you know, this is because, you know, doing this can, you know, can, can be time consuming. You've got to run your own count, count star queries to look for the correlations. Uh, now, we do provide a statistics advisor as part of uh, uh, IBM Data Server Manager, and it, it does have, uh, uh, it does recommend column group statistics, but, you know, some, some shops and users, it's not as usable to have to fire up an advisor and, and give it a workload of queries and, and, and get these extra column group stats and other stats options. So uh, it's better if we can just build this into DB2 uh, directly. And so that's what happens. Uh, this this option, uh, as I mentioned, is off by default. We, we, the strategy we tend to do with new autonomic features is that when they're first introduced, they'll be disabled by default, and after they've been out there for, you know, a, you know, a major release cycle, uh, we'll consider enabling them by default. And uh, I think, Martin, we're going to wrap it up pretty close to the top of the hour. If that, uh, so I'm going to probably make this the my last page is a very important one. I wanted to talk about how uh, AutoStats overhead has been minimized so that uh, you're comfortable with using it in your, in your shop. So the, uh, the background stats collection is throttled. It's guaranteed to have no more than a 7% uh, impact on a running, uh, running workload. So if there's other stuff on the system, the auto run stats is never going to take up more than 7%. Or the uh, synchronous collection that occurs at uh, optimization time is never going to take longer than five seconds by default, and you can configure that. The uh, the synchronous collection uh, will never update the catalogs, <clears throat> so there's no I/O overhead, no locking. It goes into a, a in-memory cache. <clears throat> You're never going to have more than uh, one you know synchronous collection occurring per table. So if you've got thousands of statements and they're all hitting the same table and they discover that stats are needed, only one of them should be actually collecting the stats. Um, you know, while that synchronous collection is going on, it's not going to block any other compilation requests. They'll continue to either fabricate or use the old stats until the new stats are collected. And the synchronous collection, or whether the synchronous or asynchronous request, they don't block any other table operations. So, you know, DDL, UDI, loads, refreshes, anything else, if they happen to contend on a on a, on a catalog uh, lock. The the uh, asynchronous asynchronous request will always silently fail and uh, retry later. So there, there's never going to be any in, any impact on on real user activity. And then you know DB2 itself can issue SQL for some internal operations or utilities. And the synchronous collection doesn't occur for those types of things, just to, to minimize the overhead to the system. So, Martin, I did have a few more topics I, I didn't get to, but it, it is noon, so I, I uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you if uh, the uh, night show needs to go a little further. Strict... Nobody's going to mind if you give us ten more minutes of free education. So, okay, sure, uh, I'm, I'm fine I to have continue. A question. Uh, and perhaps I missed it. I, I was watching for it, but then I got uh, distracted with host duties here. Um, I was just wondering how you set up the automatic um, column correlation statistics. I, I know we've, you've used the policy number and revision as a fine example, but uh, how do I let the automatic statistics know which columns need to be correlated together? Is that something you can do internally or? Well, actually, that's the whole point is that you don't you don't have to do that anymore. Okay. You just set the you just set the database configuration parameter, and DB2 will figure out what columns are correlated, and it will awesome. it will automatically create yeah. a statistic profile that has all the what it determines to be the interesting column groups. Now, is there a way in the catalog for me to go through and see which uh, columns have now been correlated? Yes, you can just query the uh, statistics profile in, in uh, syscat.tables and see, uh, you know, what column groups um, uh, DB2 recommends. Yep. Because that, that's an important thing. I always give the example of somebody delivering to 200 cities, and uh, uh, 
in the U.S. and there's they, people have the state as well as the city, and they some people can overestimate that by 200 times 50 states, right? Yeah. With a number of 10,000, it's always intriguing to me. Uh, the main thing you're doing with correlated statistics is to actually uh, uh, let DB2 and other people know that there, there's not that many unique values. You're, you're trying to show a lower number of, of uh, values than, than, than the greatest number possible. But that's kind of fun. Okay, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Okay, so uh, the next topic was on how to monitor automatic stats collection. So there's three uh, table uh, three table functions that were introduced specifically for that purpose. So mentioned that um, <clears throat> there's these internal queues uh, where you know you know requests for you know either you know background stats or auto run stats uh, go, and uh, you can see what's actually in that queue with uh, these table functions. So the first one, mon get auto run stat queue will tell you uh, which which objects are queued for an evaluation. So this this uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that um, they're going to have stats collected, it just means that they're next to be checked to see whether they, they need stats to be collected. And then if they need to uh, if they need to have stats collected, then they get moved to the uh, the queue uh, auto main queue which includes uh, all kind of automatic uh, maintenance functions, including run stats. And so you can go there and check for anything on the queue. Some might be there for reorgs, uh, but they, there's a, a field that will indicate which ones are there for run stats. Now that's for the uh, background st uh, stats collection that was uh, queued up by the kind of the normal auto, auto run stats background evaluation. Any, we, we actually internally have a separate queue for any requests that were generated by the optimizer. And so there's a, there's a different real-time stats uh, request queue and a separate table function to check what's on that queue. And I'll just point out that uh, you'll never have a table, the same table will never be on, on both queues. So we won't, we, won't, we, won't, we won't have two of them you know, going at the same time. There are a variety of um, monitor uh, metrics returned with MongoDB database, MongoDB database detail about, uh, you know, the size of the stats cache, number of fabrications that have occurred, you know, the number of backgrounds, synchronous, uh, uh, you know, uh, asynchronous or, or real-time stats requests. There are um, a bunch of other metrics returned by, at this point, 12 different monitoring table functions. Over, over the years, there's been a lot of different monitoring functions uh, introduced that have served different purposes. Um, in this case, these met, the metrics shown on this page uh, are available through all, all 12 different functions. And they kind of show some of the similar information, like the total amount of time spent on fabrication or stats collection. Uh, you know, in case you you have you know you're con you have concerns that there's you know what's the overhead of these operations on on your system, you can actually you know use the monitoring to to find out exactly what's going on. The admin get tab info table function uh, returns some information uh, pertinent to auto run stats. So uh, one one that's very important is uh, for the uh, you know how. Uh, so if you're looking at a set of stats and, you, and you're wondering, you know, where do those stats come from? Were they, um, you know, done? You know, were they collected by a run stats driven by the user, or maybe they were collected by fabrication, or or by the background auto run stats or the real time stats? The stats type column in the admin get tab info will tell you how they're collected. I mentioned that the decision about whether or not to collect statistics is determined based on two counters, the UDI counter and the RDS UDI counter. Those are reported by admin get tab info. And then in a, in a database partition environment, run stats only collect stats on one database partition. Uh, it's kind of a form of sampling. And if you want to know on, what's, on what node stats, or what database partition stats collection is occurring, that, that is also reported to the stats DB partition column. 
DB2 support will also report some of that same information. So the, UD, the uh, UDI counter and RDS UDI counter uh, are part of what we call the, the table control block stats. And I've mentioned before that there's this, the statistics cache option, so you can see you know the actual you know stats are, that are in the stats cache. Now the explain facility also has a way to show you the stats that are in the stats cache. And this is, this is really helpful because uh, explain, um, when you do an explain, it will show uh, some of the relevant stats uh, at the end of the explain output, uh, but it doesn't show everything. If you want to see all statistics that are relevant to every you know, object referenced uh, by the SQL statement being explained, there's a little trick to do that. If you collect both the explain and the explain snapshot, then uh, all the stats that are relevant will be showing. And this is this becomes even more important with real-time stats because sometimes you do an explain and then you look at the system catalogs to see, well, I wonder what kind of stats were being used. The, because of the stats cache, the, the, the stats in the catalog might not reflect the stats that the optimizer used. If you collect the explain snapshot, it will pull the stats directly from the stats cache, so you know that what you're seeing are exactly the stats that the optimizer saw when it optimized that data. Another important topic uh, are, is the statistics logging facility. So it logs all statistics collection activities done by DB2. So this is, you know, whether it's uh, you know, the, the synchronous, asynchronous stats, whether any manual run stats, you know, stats collected by load, they all show up uh, in this log, which is under the uh, SQL DB2 dump directory under the uh, an events directory. Uh, there's a set of files that are called DB2 ops stats, and there's a number, uh, there, there's multiple files, uh, and it's a rotating log. Um, the, um, you can control the size of, of the log and how many files using the DB2 opstats log uh, registry variable. And so this stats log, there's a couple of different ways to view it. You can just you can just look at the text output, or you can actually use the a table function and run queries against the stats log. And I've done this uh, fairly often to you know check on auto run stats activities for you know various situations where there's been you know some some question about whether stats are occurring frequently enough or maybe too frequently and I find this very helpful there's some example uh, queries shown in the knowledge center and in the speaker notes and so this just gives you a quick sample to so this what you're seeing on the screen here I can see when uh, you know the background auto run stats even woke up to do an evaluation, uh, this, you know, show any synchronous requests that were done by the optimizer or any background ones that were initiated by the optimizer. Lots of, lots of good information that you, you can get. One, one tip is that I find it's usually better just to, you know, pull the stats logs and insert them into a, into a table with the same schema um, if you're going to repeatedly Query it through the to the through the PD get diag his table function because that that can be a little slower and it's a lot faster if you put it in a table and maybe put a few indexes on and even and even do a run step on that table. Um, I guess this would be the the last uh, last page I have to go over. So a few few considerations in a in an MPP environment. Uh, there's only one database agent performing. Uh, Synchronous stats collection or fabrication, and they're collected on a single database partition. And so, uh, to ensure consistency in that environment, uh, DB2 will determine a kind of a stats reference database partition, and it'll, it'll ensure that uh, you know stats or RTS are done on that particular partition. And this typically ends up being the first partition in the uh, database partition group. And the uh, the sensitivity analysis will use the UDI counter from, from the same uh, reference database partition. At that point, uh, Martin, that's uh, all I, I uh, plan to cover on auto stats in DB2. Awesome. What a great, great amount of information there, John.
appreciate you doing it. And, uh, Very well. Nice for me to be able to ask a few of my questions as I go through this stuff. I uh, just want to take over and do the uh, last bit of cleanup here in terms of uh, asking our final polling question. In addition to uh, announcing, uh, we always say that we uh, we look through the attendees and see which person has been paying the most attention is normally how we do it. And last time we ran a show, it was Al Hinojos of, uh, of uh, AAA California. So uh, I believe you've been contacted and should have received a gift card from uh, DBI for being a, a member of our studio audience and part of the DB2 community. And with that, uh, my last duty that I have to do is to ask our famous question, which is to ask people if they learned anything today. And the, the poll should be open now. And we often find that we get uh, really close to 100%. And uh, I'll let that run for just a little while longer. I'll close that off and share the results. And look at that, John. 100% of our audience learned something today. That's what we like to see. I certainly uh, learned something, and I think it's uh, hopefully this will help people understand the hard work that you folks do on the IBM lab in Toronto. I was there last week attending the IDUG Data Tech Summit, and uh, it's nice for me because I don't have to get on a plane to come come to see you. But uh, that's right. It's, you just have to pay, pay for the 407. Or not. <laughs> that's right. That's almost like a, a short flight in terms of the cost of doing that. But uh, with that, I'll remind people again, uh, the uh, founding sponsor of the DBT Night Show is uh, DBI. And DBI thanks you for attending and looks forward to the next show. We'll see you next month on, I believe, October the, uh, well, we're in October. I think it's uh, November the 8th is what I meant to say. But, uh, the months are flying by. It's not how many years I've been, have I been doing this now? Uh, anyway, I'll cue the music, and I'll, I'll wish everyone a great weekend and a great week, and we look forward to seeing you on the next DB2 Night Show. Thanks again, John. Okay, you're oh. welcome. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.